Yeah, I'm 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 looking for uh, from my from my buddies. Everybody sees the sees the slide. Everything's good. Okay, rock and roll. Um, We're good. Okay, I'm going to um, you know kind of start out talking a little bit about. Um, Oh, come on, computer. I'm going to give you just kind of an idea of what it is that we're going to talk about. Um, that one of those things that's kind of obligatory in these things and, and you know, is to kind of ask, answer the question, why are we here today? And we want to talk a little bit about the Sonance history and, um, and philosophies of why we do things. Not so much to pound our chests, but to give you kind of an idea of where we've come from and how we've evolved to the, uh, the type of company that we are now and the type of products that we, uh, that we have. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the outdoor audio opportunity. It's um, not to not to try to uh, you know um, uh, imitate the president, but it's huge. It's a it's a huge opportunity, and it's one that, that we would like everybody to be a part of. Oh, I got the hands from Scott. That's great. Um, we want to talk a little bit about how we take the traditional approach versus the optimal approach, and how we move that outside. And if you're if you're unfamiliar with that terminology, we'll kind of go into it a little bit later to you know kind of uh, let you kind of understand what it is that we mean by traditional versus versus optimal. Uh, and we, we are going to go through the product lineup, and there will be plenty of time for um, all the specific questions. I know a lot of us got into this industry because we you know have either wear a propeller on our head or we're really into the stuff, so we will have some time to talk about the uh, the particulars and then kind of kind of have a wrap up. And in the wrap up, I. Uh, I, I normally say that's a good good opportunity for Q and A, but uh, it might also be a great opportunity if you've got some, um, oh maybe some um, anecdotal stories about you know um, a garden series that you installed that uh, that uh, you know you found some shortcuts on or something like that that you could share with your compadres. Feel free to you know kind of uh, kind of jump into that. So that's what uh, that's what we're going to kind of do today. Um, if it weren't for these two guys. Um, Guys like Scott and I wouldn't have a job. Uh, this is Scott Struthers and Jeff Spencer. These are the two founders of the company. Not only are they, are they the founders of the company, they're still best friends, and they still are involved with the company on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's really good to have these guys that, that had the vision of how this, uh, this company was started that can continue to kind of guide us and help us to uh, uh, get where it is that we are today. Uh, the, the short story is, is basically they were college roommates, they uh, decided to head to Southern California for spring break one year and decided, hey, let's stay. This beats the heck out of uh, the winters in the Midwest. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we see if we can do something uh, out here? And they developed a company, uh, an integration company. Uh, at the time, it wasn't really referred to as integration. They were basically stereo hookup guys. And, and they uh, you know, would pull together uh, disparate components and, and kind of hook them up together. And uh, the story goes that uh, um, on one particular installation, they had a client that said, look, I, I really like these Bang & Olufsen speakers that you're, you're wanting to put in my living room, but I, I really don't want to give up that floor space. Is there something that we can do to, you know, maybe, um, you know, I don't know, what, what, what would that look like? And one of them, and it's, it's still, it's never been clear to me which one actually had the, uh, the, uh, the aha moment, uh, decided what if we were to take a bookshelf speaker, cut the front of the speaker off, create a frame with which we could actually mount this on a wall so that we're not taking up floor space. And that was kind of the first, well, it was the first high fidelity architectural speaker that our industry ever came up with. And it was, it was a little kludgy, we admit that, but it, it helped to kind of springboard us to, you know, a lot of other things like, um, you know, in 35 years, we've, we've had some pretty cool stuff happen. We've actually had, uh, you know, uh, more awards than virtually anyone else in the industry, which to us is kind of like uh, is it kind of confirms what we think, which is we're going down the right path. Right. And, you know, it, and the reason why you're seeing Oscar and all that is because if you stop and look at it, since we have so many of them, you could kind of think of it as we have more Oscars than any other Hollywood producer would have. So it's, it's kind of a that's kind of how he sort of fits into that thing. So we're really proud of this. It, it, we, we honestly believe that, it, that it's our industry that is saying, you're doing the right thing, keep it, keep it up. So that kind of leads us to you know, all kinds of stuff. And everything that drives us has, has something or, or everything to do with this particular sentence, that we believe that your speakers should blend in with the design of your space and be comfortable to listen to. That internally, we kind of refer to that as our why. That's why we exist. That's why we do what we do. And, you know, some of the things that, that we, we, you know, kind of look at, like the aesthetics, um, you know, sometimes that matters a lot more than a client may let on. It may, 
also matter a lot more than it probably should sometimes. But if you stop and think about the fact that we visualize things a lot more than we do um, perceive them with our ears, especially if we're talking about distributed audio, then we want these devices. We want these components. We want them to go away. Uh, we, we want them to, you know, just not be seen, to disappear. And that's, that's kind of where, where our uh, inside uh, immersive audio and our outside immersive audio have kind of um, been allowed to uh, uh, expand because we've had these products that, that because they're designed to disappear, we can put them in so many different areas. But, you know, if, even if we just, you know, looked at the aesthetic part of it, that, that's fine, you know, but we also need to think about things that are a little bit more uh, towards what we, what we do. Okay. Computer wants to play fun. Um, this element of comfort that it should be comfortable to listen to. If we can hide the stuff, well, now we want to worry about, you know, how we want to make it comfortable to, to listen to. We're not looking to create a two channels experience in someone's backyard. We can't. It's, it's impossible. Um, so when we stop and, and, and look at things like, um, you know, putting two speakers in the backyard versus an immersive, um, you know, fully covering system, it, it makes much more sense to lean towards the immersive sound because, um, you know, this coverage, fidelity, and output, you know, those, those are the three things that, that put together will equal comfort. And that's really what's going on. I mean, you see in this picture, the obvious, they're entertaining, they're barbecuing, they're drinking wine. This is obviously pre-COVID. Uh, but this is, this is what people do in their outside space. They, they do not go out there and critically listen to sound. And they certainly don't want the sound to be over and above or create a noise floor that's so loud that they can't have a conversation with either you know, the kids or granddad or whatever. And the way we approach that is we look at this you know, traditional approach, which you'll see on the left with a couple of speakers that are on the house versus an even you know, uh, balanced coverage on the right. The, this is... This is that difference that I'm t I was talking about when we talk about traditional versus immersive. So when you look at these two graphs, you kind of see what it is that we're, we're kind of talking about. Um, in the, the case of a traditional approach, we've got all kinds of problems, like being too loud when you're close to the speaker or being between the two speakers and there being a big hole in the coverage uh, or, or you know, not having sound loud enough out toward the perimeter of the space. Not to mention that we're disrupting neighbors by throwing energy in that direct, that you know specific direction. So the traditional approach has a lot of things to it that really kind of fly in the face of what our our daily goals are. We've got unbalanced coverage, so we we have the the, the potential for creating conversations like I can't hear it, turn it up, and then someone else says no, that's too loud, turn it down, and eventually someone says we'll just turn it off since we can't control it. And in the case of unwanted noise, I mean. We joke about it, but nobody really wants the cops coming and saying, turn your, turn your stereo down. So that's, that's kind of the traditional approach that is much different than this optimal approach. And the optimal approach is to take the, the sound, create an even and balanced coverage, much like they do in uh, the commercial space, and, and do it in such a way that we, uh, that we can cover that space nicely, easily, and make it very comfortable to listen to. And it does things like by focusing the energy on the perimeter and firing it back in towards the, the space rather than over into the neighbor's yard, we can still get that even coverage, but we also don't have the unwanted noise or the disturbances that, that uh, we could create with the, with the neighbors. And it's not a, a difficult process to go through. It may just be a little bit different than you're used to. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, in a, in a typical space like this, which, you know, who has a typical space, but, you know, we've got an area of, call it 2,000 square feet that we want to contain the sound in. That's the area that we're, where we want to keep the music. And we don't want there to be sound along the outside. So by creating this grouping of satellites and subwoofer, we're able to get the high fidelity that we're looking for, the dispersion that we're looking for, and the ease and the, and the, uh, the coverage and all of that sort of stuff that we're looking for. That's what really separates these types of systems from, from others. And I'm, I'm saying that because right now I'm just talking about, you know, these systems. I'm not specifically talking about a Sonant system. This it's, is what drives us, but we're starting to see that the rest of the industry is sort of catching up and, and kind of figuring out that that's really what clients are asking for too. So you're seeing a lot of that stuff that, that's out there. So if you, if you think about, you know, what the space is going to be, be used for, it's going to be used for this. It's going to be used for hanging out with friends. It's going to be, you know, having a birthday party. It's going to be, you know, having a barbecue. It's going to be, it, 
these are the primary reasons why the out, outdoor space has become the new living room because you can have so many friends over. You're, you're not confined to you know the boundaries of walls and ceilings and all. You 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 can really just enjoy life. And these are the sorts of things that that kind of drive our um, our approach towards the the immersive sound. I will say that there are some some entities out there that have absolutely perfected it. And uh, those of you that have either, either visited uh, Disneyland or maybe a Six Flags uh, amusement park or, or some, something along those lines, they've really, really perfected that immersive sound. You don't see speakers anywhere. Uh, in, in this particular case, um, um, in Main Street Disneyland, there are speakers that are hidden in the buildings on either side of the, uh, of the street. There are speakers in those green trash cans that you see lining the street. They have, they have hidden the stuff everywhere, and they've known that instead of sitting up, setting up a big PA system on the castle there, that they needed to, to spread that out. Okay, so this is one of those areas where you can kind of you know, make this as an analogy as to this is the goal to have completely immersive sound and not see anything, okay? All right, so if we all agree that, you know, that, that the backyard remodelings and things like that are, are, are continuing to be, you know, one of the most important uh, uh, segments of construction and all that, and, and if, you're, if you're not, we'll kind of go into some numbers, um, you know, this, this is something that I think really hits home. It's expected that 48% of the design spaces, okay, in backyards are going to include audio, video, and internet connectivity as a part of that design element. Now, between you, me, and the fence post, I think that television is grossly wrongly placed. It looks like, mm, but you get the idea here. This is some. This is a space where technology is important to the client, and they they wanted a TV, but you don't see any speakers. You don't see you know the the internet connectivity. You don't see all of that other stuff that that is a part of it. And if we look at, you know, some of the, 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 the things that, that people are asking their or the exterior designers to include, obviously some of the things at the, at the top of the list, uh, people want fire pits and lighting and, and all that sort of stuff. And at the bottom, I mean, showers and baths and outdoor cooling fans. I mean, that's, that's uh, maybe a little bit more specialized. But if you look at outdoor audio, it's right smack dab in the middle at 48%. What that means is, and oh, by the way, this was something that was put together by um, kind of the CEDIA of landscape architects, the American Society of Landscape Architects. And they asked their members, talk to your clients, tell, ask them what will you be looking for in terms of elements that are gonna go into these designs. And we found that of all of these, the one that, that affects us the most is that outdoor audio, meaning one in two groups, one in two clients said, we wanna have music outdoors. That's, that's something that is huge because there is, if you look at how many people are putting together technology in homes, we, we think it's 100% because that's what we do on a daily basis. But if you look at the overall um, uh, market, there are probably 80% of the homes that are being built and, and populated lately that don't have any technology in, indoors, or at least they don't have the technology that we would be required to either install or integrate. There's a lot of you know Sonos players out there and things like that. So. The, there's a lot of, of non-technology areas that are asking for our sort of thing, okay? And people are looking to sort of take the outdoor space and, and, and kind of extend it into, you know, their, their overall lifestyle. They want to spend more and more time out there, especially with like friends and family. So they look at, okay, I want sound in the backyard. What, what are some of my options? Well, uh, these are some of the options that we know about. You know, there, there's everything from portable speakers, you know, through um, surface mount or box speakers, rocks, and, and even things like the Sony uh, Landscape Series or Garden Series, Patio Series, the subwoofer satellite things. There's a lot out there, okay? They've got a ton of choices. But if they're left on their own, it's, it's not that they're, that they're not educated. Maybe that's part of it. But their imagination is not very, very large. I mean, we, we as designers, we, we think with our heads in, in terms of what can I do with this space? They're just thinking about how do I get sound in the backyard? Well, the easiest way might be to just, you know, grab a Bluetooth speaker and take it out and, you know, put it between a couple of seats like this or maybe put it in the middle of the picnic table. And if we think back to some of those slides, we, we know right away it's not going to cut it. Uh, it's going to be, you know, fine sound for right around the speaker. But as soon as you move to the other side of the pool, you're not going to hear that thing. It just doesn't have that, that ability to cover, cover the space. And when we talk to people, 
we find that they they want great sounding audio. They want that 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 wonderful experience outside. But we have to show them what's possible because again, their imagination is not too clear. Now, when we when we look at selling product and we're selling an outdoor you know audio system, you know there are some things that we look at that uh, you know kind of are getting in the way, you know and and. These are the objections that I, I get to, to play with on a daily basis. So I've kind of put together or pulled together from uh, uh, some of my uh, colleagues uh, a couple of things that answer some of these these questions. Like you know, it's, it's too expensive. Well, we kind of looked at a couple of areas throughout the U.S. and said, you know, is it really too expensive? Um, we started in in the uh, uh, Pacific Northwest. Started in Washington State, and we found that there were um, you know there were all of these elements that people are putting into their backyard that, that create a budget, you know, there's, um, you know, grass, there's trees, there's um, shrubs, there's irrigation systems and, you know, lighting systems and all that, all that other sort of stuff. And that, you, know, you can see where that kind of totals out to. And this is just sort of a, an average kind of thing. I mean, they, a lot of the projects you guys work on, they might have a, a budget of 13,000 just, you know, for, you know, one zone of lighting, but you know, this gives you kind of an idea of you know what a, a basic, um, you know, average just, uh, backyard would would set someone back. And we look at you know if we offered them a patio series that you know starts out at two thousand dollars, we're only about fifteen percent of their overall budget. So it's not like it's a huge number. I mean, it's a, it's an investment. Don't get me wrong, but it's not something that's out of the question, especially when you start can you know comparing it to things that that aren't necessarily going to give you any enjoyment. I mean. I just put an irrigation system into my own backyard, but I don't go back there and look at it and go, Ooh, that's so cool. That's so wonderful. It just has to be there. It's, it's utilitarian. But I'll tell you what, when I go back there, I turn on my, my old, uh, old uh, landscape system. And every time I'm in the backyard, it's, it's playing. So it's, it, it's one of those things where it just will add something to, to everything. But again, I think it's number, it's cost is within reason when you start talking about uh, the overall budget. And we move to some place that's a little bit closer to home, uh, to me anyway, Texas. And we ask, you know, is it really expensive? We, and we look at some of the, uh, some of the, the totals, if you will, of, uh, of, of an outdoor uh, uh, landscape section. We're, you know, we're talking about 19,000 bucks. Everything from mulch and trees to pest control, trust me, we need it, and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's around 20 grand, okay, is a, is a, is a good average. If we look at the garden series, starting at $4,000, it's about 17% of the outdoor budget. Again, it's within the realm of reason as far as budget is concerned, talking about outdoor audio, okay? Now, something that uh, is one of the ones that was the most surprising to me. Um, I wasn't surprised <laughs> that in California, the, uh, the cost of real estate is ridiculously expensive. The cost of construction is ridiculously expensive. Even the cost of, of making that, uh, that project uh, feel good uh, or, or look good is expensive. I mean, here are the same basic things. Uh oh, what was that going? The same, same basic elements that, you that we found in those other two examples you know, total up to almost $45,000. Well, a garden series system starting at 4,000 is only 9% of that budget. So same kind of product, but in this case, it's actually fitting in as, as a budget, uh, budget line item a lot better than it did in the other two states. So it's, it's again, I'm, I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, but it's, it's in the realm of possibility. It's not out of the question, okay? So knowing that, one of the other things that we've got to deal with is, okay, we're f sometimes forgetting to offer it. And, and that's kind of a catch-all phrase. Um, you know, the outdoor, sound, uh, outdoor audio or outdoor spaces, rather, they tend to, I'm not saying that everybody does this, but they tend to be one of the last things that get factored in, which is sometimes why you end up with just, you know, a couple of speakers outdoors because the budget's been eaten up. But ha be that as it may, if we, forget to, if we forget to offer it or we wait until, you know, the end to offer it, then we're going to get what we get. We found that there's a, there's a way to kind of help to combat that. It, it won't eliminate this problem. Okay, but it will help to combat this problem. And that is, we have demo kits. These are systems that can be taken out into someone's backyard, their own backyard. You can set it up in less than 20 minutes. If you notice, there's a, a big coil of wire right there. And that coil of wire, about every 10 feet is a connection. And those satellites and that subwoofer all have plugs on them. So you can connect these plugs up to that wiring harness. And within, like I said, within 20 minutes, you can make music. And we have found that 
that's what makes the difference in talking about outdoor audio and increasing uh, your average sale price in, in the backyard audio from you know a pair of speakers to a fully immersive system. Okay, but it's all it's all about how you present it. It's all about you know getting it out there and and showing it to them. When we do this, and I say we, Stonance, we will go on our own and take a list of qualified uh, clients from a dealer. We will go and do demos because we know it's a numbers game. In the call it. 13, 14 years that we've been doing this, these outdoor systems, we average about an 80% close rate. And that's with anyone that's just happens to give us the time of day to listen to a demo. Some of them, the, the, the sales of, you know, leave this one. Some of them are, well, we need twice this. Some of them are just, you know, well, this, this is great. I love this concept, but it's a little expensive. Is there something that you can, and, and we have answers to all of that, which is why we have this, this full family. So again, this is, demonstration kit will do more to add to your bottom line than any other thing that I've, I've seen out there because a it's fun to do B you're doing it in their backyard so they, they they don't have that that uncertainty of well it sounds good in the showroom but what about my backyard and when you take it away when you disconnect it that's we used to refer to that as the puppy dog clothes you go to the you go to the pound somebody hands you a puppy and then takes it away you want the puppy back you want you want you want to take that puppy it creates some kind of a psychological I want it well, that, that kind of works in this thing as well. These are so much fun to do. Um, work with your, with your branch uh, to, uh, they all have these demo kits. Work with them as to whether or not you can, you know, uh, take it out on your own or maybe get one of their guys to go out with you in the first couple just so you have somebody that you can kind of, you know, lean on, if you will, uh, to, you know, to help you get through that first one. But these demo kits, more than anything I've ever done in audio, uh, help to close more, more sales than than I can count. And so I, again, I, I, I get off on tangents about, you know, demo kits and things like that because I get a little, a little too passionate about it, but I think you get the point. Um, if you, if you follow through with this, you're going to find that there's a very huge part of the market. And, you know, I mentioned earlier about having, you know, places to go. If for whatever reason, um, you know, we're, we're lucky enough to be, you know, in about a one out of every two of the uh, CE Pro 100 dealers have been, you know, selling our stuff. But if you look at some of these other brands, you'll see that, that they're, they're, uh, they're coming up as well. Uh, Snap AB comes to mind or Origin comes to mind. These are, these are companies that have seen that the success we've had is worth, it, it's, it's worth the concept. It's a concept. It's not a, you know, let's take their technology and run with it. It's a concept. And in this case, it's immersive audio. And these companies have, have done really well in, in bringing that up. And that does absolutely nothing but help the overall industry. Okay. Now, Last, you know, pump in my chest, um, you know, these, these are just a few of the awards that, that we've um, uh, accumulated over the years uh, in terms of, of, of outdoor audio. And I, I only put these up because it kind of leads into what I'm about to talk about. And that, that is, you know, how we go about developing these products. It's not, let's grab some stuff off the shelf, kludge it together and hope that it works. Um, our chief speaker designer, Todd Ryan, um, has started working with, tools like the clipple distortion analyzer that, that allows him to literally look at a driver and measure its physical characteristics as it plays and it shows them uh, shows him on a graph it doesn't it doesn't fix anything what it does is it helps him to identify what needs to be adjusted so that he can get the goal and his goal is to have completely flat frequency response that's not to say you're going to have that in somebody's backyard that's too much base said no one ever but at the same time, you want to have kind of a benchmark to work off of, and having a, a flat frequency response is uh, is a, is a great place to start. Okay, so this is one of the one of the uh, elements that Todd uses to kind of help to develop some of these um, products. He also works with material designers to design specific materials. So instead of just saying, you oh, know, we're going to make it out of polypropylene, um, he's been able to do some things like laminates of Roacel with um, carbon fiber and, you know, so, so he's got stiffness, but he's also got lightweight, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, material management is also help, uh, very uh, helpful when it comes to designing and Clip will kind of, you know, points him in that general direction. It's not something that, that every company uses, but it, again, it's, it's becoming more used within the industry. It's just that, that Sonet's kind of adopted it a little bit early. You know, we thought, you know, hey, this, this makes sense. Let's, let's use this. Let's go forward with it and, uh, um, and apply it to as, you know, many 
products as we possibly can. And we have to every product that's been uh, released since um, 07, 06 or 07, somewhere, somewhere in that, that, that time frame. Okay. So when, when we ask the question, well, okay, so that's what makes you better at outdoor audio than, than, you know, than some of these others? Well, I, I think you have to kind of look at, you know, the, the track record. And that's why we showed those, or why I showed you those awards, why I showed you that, you know, Todd uses the clipple. We, you know, we, we come up with a lot of really cool stuff. And what I, I, what I mean by that is we come up with things that, that are ideas that will help to grow your business by creating new categories. Something totally unrelated to this, but, but just popped into my head. Things like an iPod docking station. This, this is a product that nobody even sells anymore. But when we first came out with it, God, 15, 16 years ago, um, you know, it was, everyone was laughing about, you know, why would you want to take, you know, those MP3 files that are on an iPod and play it throughout your home? Well, because that iPod holds 10,000 of my favorite songs and I'd like to listen to them. So, the, so this, you know, iPod docking station came along and, you know, you go forward a little bit. There was frameless speakers in our architectural series that, that to date, only one other company has, uh, has been able to um, emulate uh, the micro bezel or the visual performance. Uh, when we came out with that grill 9, 10, 12 years ago, you know, at, at, the, at first it was like, why are you doing that? Nobody cares what it looks like. But if you look now, everybody's kind of copied it. So we've got a pretty good um, track record, if you will, of coming up with some pretty good ideas. The satellite subwoofer thing, I'm not saying was our idea. We were just the one that, that took that idea and kind of broad based it took it out to hey let's find a way to show this to more people and that's kind of how we we've gotten to where we are today so when we talk about um you know being better um, i think that kind of is a, a good enough segue if you will to kind of you know move into starting to talk about some of the specifics of the products and we'll start with the patio series this is the uh this is actually the newest addition to our line it's uh, some of you that may have been around a while um uh, and we're perhaps selling the Sonaray kit or the Sonaray system up to this point. Um, you may have seen the patio series, our introduction to it, and thought, well, hey, there's the new Sonaray. Um, the patio series really isn't the new Sonaray. Um, it was, it was a, a way for us to go in two different directions. It was a way for us to improve the performance of the Sonaray, but also it allowed us to um, address something that was almost gosh, every time we talked to a dealer, it was like, hey, can you just come up with something for the smaller zone? I don't, I don't, I don't need something to cover, you know, three, four, 5,000 square feet. I just need something for that little backyard patio thing, you know, suburban, you know, townhouse kind of deal. And that's why we came up with the patio series and, and built it in such a way that it could be um, expanded. Let me show you. It could be expanded to a full eight satellite, two subwoofer system by putting two of these two of these pieces together, but it could also be used as a four one or four satellites in one, one subwoofer to handle a smaller space, like a thousand square feet. So here again, it gave us the opportunity to open up even more of the market for product like this that will create that, that immersive sound. And uh, again, uh, you know, you can expand this system out to up to eight satellites and two subwoofers. So if it came down to, hey, I know we talked about just putting four satellites and a subwoofer around my little fire pit, but I've also got like a uh, you know, bocce ball court, whatever. I've got that over, you know, over there. Can I, can I add a system to that as well? Well, absolutely you can because of the way the system's put together, we can, come, we can put up to eight satellites and two subs on one of our two 125 amplifiers. So there is room to grow. Now, I will, I will caution you, that's as far as you can go with the patio. And the, the rationale, let me see if I can kind of go back here, is that if you start looking at things like that third piece down, the high impedance sats, um, these, each of these satellites in the, in the patio series um, are approximately uh, 16, 17 ohms a piece. So they're not, you know, your traditional eight ohm speaker, but that's also how I can, oops, I'm going the wrong way, my bad, pilot error. It's also how I can put multiple devices in a parallel wiring scheme. So if you, if you guys have done, any of you have done 70 volt systems, you'll look at this and go, hey, that wire's kind of like a 70 volt system. It's exactly the, the point. We wanted to keep the wiring as simple as possible. But to be able to do that, we had to have impedances on these, these satellites that when you put them in parallel, add up to, at, at minimum, a four ohm load back at the amplifier. 
So we didn't want the amplifier to be taxed with, you know, two ohms or one ohm or, or you know, something like that. And in these low Z or low, um, low impedance systems like this, there really is kind of a, kind of a, a, a basement. You can't go below, you know, much more lower than two ohms. But at the same time, we wanted to have the flexibility of, of kind of, you know, taking this, taking this out. So if I, um, again, go back to here. These these bullet points may be a little bit on the on the tight side to read, but you can see that you know this is a, a system that's been designed to go outside and stay outside. These, these all weather satellites are designed to be able to be rained on, snowed on, iced on, um, weed whackered on, you know whatever. They're made to to be installed and and stay outside. I I'm stressing that because I still have people clients that are asking dealers in front of me. <laughs> Can I just leave these outside? Well, of course you can. It's, that's what they're designed to do. Um, again, you can see the coverage in the second bullet. Um, you know, uh, a uh, four satellite, one subwoofer can cover a thousand square feet. And we do think a lot in terms of, of coverage. You're kind of seeing a, a reoccurring theme. If we go to an 8.2, we can actually double, uh, more than double that to 2,500 square feet, okay? So this, these are the sorts of things that, that uh, I think add up to why the patio system is such a, a, a good uh, value. And again, not to back up too far, but when I said, you know, the, the, some of you knew the Sonoray, sold the Sonoray, and now you're wondering, well, if I put together um, two patio systems on an amplifier, I'm kind of getting the same uh, performance level as I would have expected to get from the Sonoray in terms of, of coverage. What about the cost? There's not a slide in here, but it's only about a, a Scott, help me out. It's only about a, a $700 MSRP difference, or is it a $150? I can't, I can never remember that number. Uh, between which version are you asking, Steve? Between a, a, a two patio series versus the Sonoray. Uh, it's $100 different at retail. There you go. There you go. I, I, the, 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 uh, the, the point of the number uh, reminded me, or I, I remembered that, you know, that it's critical. Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm, as you, if you can't tell by now, I'm clearly not one of the sales guys. I'm one of the tech guys. But you know, that I think that's an important element because even though we've improved the performance parameters of the of the product, um, we were able to do it in such a way that it wasn't so cost prohibitive. I mean, 100 bucks that's nothing. Okay. So, um, the Garden Series. Now, the Garden Series takes again takes the 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 idea behind the satellite subwoofer type approach and kind of brings it up a notch in terms of, of performance. With the garden series, we've got elements like a two-way design in the satellite versus a single driver in the patio series, a 10-inch woofer in the, um, in the subwoofer as opposed to an 8-inch in the patio series. And it is designed to be an 8-1 system right away. And again, because of the, the way that we put the impedance load on each of the individual satellites and having a, having a, a high, high impedance on the satellites, we're able to put more of them on the line, okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me, I can have eight satellites and a subwoofer and, have, and show pretty much an eight ohm load at the amplifier, okay? If I, um, let me go here. If I were to add, let's say another, um, four satellites and a subwoofer to that, that system, I can cover more square footage. And I'm pretty much only showing back at the amplifier, I'm showing somewhere around five to six ohms, maybe as low as four, okay? So the long and the short of it is, is you've got you know, the ability with the garden series to cover 3,500 square feet with it right out of the box. You can increase your coverage by getting a four pack of satellites, maybe a subwoofer. I can increase to a 12 two, in other words, 12 satellites and two subwoofers. Now, as I do this, I'm, I'm getting closer and closer to that, that, that magical, you know, four ohm minimum, you know, two ohm, or two ohm minimum, two ohm stable, whatever. This, this is where, where it starts getting a little bit crazy. But if I had to, if I wanted to, I could safely put together 16 satellites and two subwoofers off of one 2125 amplifier and be able to cover almost 6,500 square feet. That's, that's something that, that is really something that I, I highly recommend that you talk about with your clients is coverage. Not talk about frequency response, not talk about dynamic range, not talk about the stuff that, that usually gets you know the, the us propeller heads excited, but talk about how we can cover this area comfortably and we can hide the stuff regardless of how much space you've got that you want to talk that you want to uh, cover. Okay. So let's talk about how we can uh, you know bring all this together. 
and when you when you're meeting with your clients and, and we're talking to them, whether you're you know meeting them uh, virtually now or whether you're uh, you know meeting them in their home when when things maybe uh, you know settle down a little bit uh, this COVID nineteen sort of thing, but you know we we think it's it's important to kind of give you a couple of of well just a couple of guide signs a couple a couple of signs on how to you know how to how to run this path and you know when we're when we're talking to, to clients and things like that we highly recommend that you ask questions that are that will start a conversation rather than you know just a simple yes no and this is one that we found to be the most effective at, at opening up the conversation to the possibility of this immersive sound with satellites and subwoofers. and we simply ask you know, how do you want your sound to look and many times the uh, the, the the more um the more artistic of, of the of the clients will will say, well, I want this and I want that and I want it to be copper and tone and I want it to be you know this. That. More people than not are going to say, what do you mean? I mean, sound doesn't look sound. You hear sound, you don't look. Well, that gives you the opportunity to talk about designing to disappear. Gives you the opportunity to talk about um, you know this optimum can, uh, uh, coverage pattern and, and things of that nature. It also gets you once you've talked about that and you kind of planted that little seed. It also can get you in the home. It can get you into the, hey, I, I know we're talking about this system and, and I know that it may seem like it's, you know, a little out there, um, but I've got a way that I can kind of temporarily set it up in your space so that you can listen to it. And then, then you can you can decide for yourself. And that does a couple of things. Uh, again, it puts it in their backyard. So it puts it in a familiar space. It allows them to listen to it via demonstration. Uh, and, it, and it also allows them to kind of imagine that it's already there. And these, these are kind of magical things. They're not tricky things. They're not, you know, they're not designed to fool anybody into doing anything. If the system sounded bad, none of this psychology would work at all, but it does. It sounds fantastic. So it gives us the opportunity to get in there, do a demo and show them what the system can actually do. And if we start with the garden series and do the demo with the garden series in their backyard, we've got somewhere to go if that conversation about, you know, price comes up and it's like, well, I really love this thing, but you know, you got something that's a little less expensive. Absolutely. There's the patio series and you can move to the patio series and answer that budget question without having to start over in your conversations about, well, and in this case, I've got to use these amplifiers and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So it makes it real simple. Okay. Uh, and, and other questions that you can ask are, do you entertain outdoors? And this is, this is one of my favorite because I've never come across anyone at least in the areas where where uh, outdoors is a is a big deal, they always say sure. And and I I include areas like I, I I'll share a very quick story with you. Um, our rep in Minnesota, uh, Kevin Klotzbach, he um, he said something to me one time that, that really hit home because I I saw his his um, sales numbers were just you know absolutely going crazy, and I was like you know Kevin talk to me you 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 live in in the virtually the frozen tundra you know, how are you selling these outdoor systems? And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, yeah, it is. We have some pretty hard winters and you've, you've experienced a few and we have some pretty hard winters and we have kind of a short, short summertime. So what that means is we take every advantage we can. We take every moment we can outdoors when we've got that, and he joked, 30, 60 days of, of summer. So, that, so the, uh, the point I'm trying to make is, is that regardless of where you live, if you have long summers, you spend quite a bit of time outside. You just don't think about it. If you've got short, short summers, you're actually focused on that time and you want to, you know, use it, use it for the best, for the, as much as you can get out of it. Okay. So that's kind of why when we, we ask about, you know, do you entertain outdoors that can kind of start some conversations about, you know, we do parties, we just hang out, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, excuse me. Hang on one second. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. I'm kind of pregnant. Pause. Um, another thing that, that I think might help uh, in terms of having discussions with your clients and, and talking about, because let me stop for just a second. When you're talking to a client about putting a bunch of speakers in a backyard space, a lot of times you're going to get the objection from the client, eight speakers. I don't listen to it that loud. I don't need that many speakers. Well, that, tells you a couple of things. One, tells you that they really don't know how sound works. And two, it also gives you the opportunity to say, well, you've experienced the performance improvement of multiple speakers. Take that, uh, that car that you, uh, that you have in the garage, okay? The chances are pretty good that that car system 
uh, that, uh, that you just bought the, you know, the, you bought the car because you like it. You like the color. It was comfortable. Yeah, the sound system was in it, but you know, no big deal. And you've grown to, you've grown to like the way that sound system sounds. Well, there might be 12, 14 speakers in that car and you didn't even know it. And again, the, it, this is not something that every client needs to have this, this conversation with, but when you're talking about the number of speakers in an outdoor space and the objection you get is, I don't listen to it that loud, it gives you the opportunity to talk about how sound works, how, how since we have no boundaries, okay, we can't get away with two speakers like we can indoors. We can, we can do it. Yes, we'll have hot spots. You won't like it. Let's, you know, let's find a way to get there, okay? And it, it also helps you to kind of, you know, become that, that professional audio system designer. I mean, this is something that, that I think our industry sometimes struggles with. We're considered to be technically astute, but not always um, design oriented. And I think with something like this, it gives you the, the, the ability to become that designer. Now, that's not something that you have to do on your own without any help whatsoever. We have available at Sonance what we call design services. Design services simply means if you've got an outdoor space and you'd like to um, have us look at that space and give you our recommendations based on a questionnaire of, of answers from, a, from your client, then we can put together a design that you can present to the client as your design doesn't have to be, you know, this is from the manufacturer. It can be your design. But at the same time, it can also be, hey, this is what the manufacturer thinks you need in the backyard based on the answers to your question. I tend to agree. Or you can at least, you know, kind of go from there in terms of, you know, if you agree or not. You, you know what I'm saying, okay? So keep that in mind. That's something that I think um, has helped out um, a lot of folks. We found that uh, of the designs that we've done, the ones that we've been able to track through to a sale, uh, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 50%. Uh, and, and truthfully, just to, you know, kind of be transparent, you know, that's, that's from qualified clients that have been given a demonstration that now want to know what they need to put into their backyard who already are on board with the concept. Uh, it'll be up to you to get them on board with the, with the concept by, by doing a demonstration, right? So, so three takeaways. I'm, I'm coming to the end here. No more, no more slides. We're going to open it up for questions. But um, the three takeaways that I want you to, you know, that hopefully you'll walk away from this with is that if you believe that speakers should blend in with the design of your space and be comfortable to listen to, that you'll evangelize that, okay, to your clients and to, you know, to folks that you, that you work with. Because this, we, we have been very successful with this and we think you can be just as successful with it. Always ask how you want the sound to look. I know we kind of hit that at the end and, and maybe even went over it a little bit fast, but always make that, have that question be a part of your interview process with the client. And truthfully, that could be inside just as well as outside. And last, take some time to get to know the complete portfolio, all of the stuff that, that Sonance has available to you. And you can do that either through uh, printed specification guides that we have, or if, you, um, if you're if uh, you a really nice guy and ask uh, one of the guys at Voluton, they could probably show you the intera their interactive guide that will you know, take you down to the, the real finite details of what the garden series is all about and what the patio series is all about, okay? I did mention design services earlier, so that, this is just sort of a sort of a reminder for me to make sure that, that I reinforce it. And um, that takes us to this, questions. Steve, there's a question that came up in the chat window uh, in, in relationship to 8 ohm versus 70 volt uh, and some of the benefits of each of those types of systems. Uh, Sonance does have solutions on both sides of that equation, uh, but oftentimes the 8 ohm solutions uh, being one that provides a little bit better uh, fidelity as well as output. Um, oftentimes the challenge with 8 ohm is in relationship to how big of a system you can scale. In most 8 ohm scenarios, it requires you to home run a speaker, meaning that every individual speaker has a wire run back to the amplifier. Uh, you address this uh, in, in some extent uh, during the, the product section, uh, but can you just speak a little bit to the wiring configuration, the way that, there's just, the way that our kits are set up uh, so that's more similar to 70 volts, um, just in the way that we can daisy chain speakers? Well, yeah, and, and I think you, you, you went a long way in, in explaining why, you know, 70 volt versus 8 ohm. Um, it's, it's not a, you know, uh, pick one. It's, uh, it's look at the application to see, you know, which one is going to be, you know, the, the, the right way to go. Now, having said that, 
Um, our first landscape kits were 70 volts specifically because that was the most expeditious way and the easiest way for us to put multiple devices. When I say multiple, like 8, 10, 12, 14 devices, okay, on a parallel run of wire and not have to worry about what that impedance load looks like back at the amplifier. Because in the case of 70 volt or, or what some call constant voltage, you're only limited by your amplifier power. So you don't have the impedance portion of that uh, thing to worry about. Now, having said that, that means that every device has a transformer on it. Okay, that's how you can get away with this 70 volt scheme. And the challenge there becomes what kind of transformer do you put on it? Do you put on it the, the affordable transformer that's used in those pie pan speakers that you see at the airport? Well, not if you want full fidelity, <laughs> you know, those, those transformers that, that you see on the, the uh, what we call audio by the acre or the public address systems and airports and such, their sole goal is there for emergency signaling. They may be playing music when they're not telling you to get out, but their sole goal is to make sure that emergency signaling is possible. And that, that's a couple of things. One, it has to be intelligible within the, the vocal range of a, of a human. So in other words, it's frequency response only has to be the voice of a human. Okay, and usually that's all it is. And it also has to be able to continue to work even if a device or two in that chain fail, because this is a safety thing, right? So all of this, all of this kind of is a, is a long way of kind of coming back to, in spite of all of that, these transformers that are full fidelity, full frequency and all that kind of stuff, they're very expensive. So they add a, quite a bit to the cost of the system. So by using a low Z or an eight ohm approach where we don't have the transformers, okay, then we're able to kind of, um, you know, value engineer, if you will, in most of the performance that we would have gotten from this high end 70 volt system versus, you know, a, a lower end or a more cost effective uh, eight ohm solution. But the way we have to do that is I, I mentioned um, quickly, I guess, that, um, you know, we have different impedances on the, on the satellites. In the case of a patio series, those uh, um, satellites each have a 16 ohm impedance to them. So if you were to just take one of those speakers and hook it up to, the, to, to an amplifier, it would play, just not very loud, okay? So by having all of those in parallel wired like 70 volt, we have the convenience and the, the uh, um, efficiency of only using one four conductor wire throughout the whole space. And we just pick one side, right, left, right, left as we, as we go through. And so we look at, you know, why eight ohm versus 70 volt is, it, ha it all has to do with the application. You know, in most backyards, eight to 16 satellites is not too, too much to consider, uh, to, you know, to think about when, in terms of coverage. We can do that through having the satellites be 30 ohm, or we can do that by having the satellites have a 70 volt transformer. And the difference is going to be primarily the cost of that transformer, which in many cases is about equal to the cost of the speaker if you, if you buy a good one. Does do, do you, does that answer your, your the caller's question? The caller's yeah, question. I think that was uh, that was good detail. Let me let me augment with just a, a couple of extra pieces. Uh, if you are wiring, whether it's a patio series or a landscape series, you're going to use a single run of a 14-4 conductor. Uh, the the satellites are are going to wire left, right, left, right, and then the subwoofer gets a left and a right channel. So. Uh, the wiring configuration in our systems at Sonans is it, even in the eight ohm systems. It's very similar to that of a 70 volt system, just by the way that you do the wiring configuration. And that's, that's one of the reasons why people tend to like 70 volt systems is that it's very easy just to daisy chain speakers along the run. Uh, so they're not having to do multiple runs back to the amplifier. Our systems uh, at, at Sonance give you that same capability, uh, but we're doing that by manipulating the impedance loads of each of the satellite speakers. So creating a, a more user friendly or more installer friendly experience uh, plus gaining some benefits of an 8 ohm system like the, the things you mentioned with value engineering and being able to save some dollars by not using those 70 volt transformers. Uh, another key question came up uh, from uh, one of our partners in, in Texas, uh, closer to you, Steve. Uh, and I, I have to apologize before I answer here in saying that not all markets uh, and, and distributors have the same mix of products. So some of you guys are only seeing uh, Sonance outdoor products. Some of you are, are working with full line distributors where there's access to more Sonance products along the way. Uh, so this may not pertain to everybody, but the question had to do with um, being able to use multiple zones within a garden series system. So may, maybe I have uh, an 8.1, can I create two different zones with that? Uh, part of my response would be uh, that that relates to how your configuration sets sometimes with an amplifier. Uh, instead of using a, 
uh, SGS 8.1, you might consider going to, a, to two different patio series kits uh, to create a 4.1 in two different zones. Uh, you can do uh, different volume levels if you're using different amplifier channels. So sometimes that requires two amps. If you're at an area where you have access to a full line of Sonians, you could always use a DSP 8130, which gives you eight channels by 130 watts of power. That allows you to create a couple different zones where you have independent volume control there. Uh, and whether that's using a Sonos piece or a, a, a HEOS or whatever your streaming device might be, Blue Sound, uh, you have different ways to manipulate volume through that portion of the platform. Uh, you could also manipulate volume directly through our amplifiers. Um, so the, the DSP8130, for example, is an IP controllable amplifier, uh, where if you were using a control system, you could use either IR or IP control to directly manipulate the volume within those channels. So there's a few different ways to skin the cat uh, when you're doing system designs. Uh, a lot of it just has to do with what your mix of products looks like. So hopefully that gives you a little bit better insight there uh, to the question. Steve, if you have anything to augment, uh, the, the question specifically, if I want to reread here, uh, we get asked a lot if we can separate zones in a garden series package, perhaps split it up and then combine zones during parties or events. Yes, and, and I think, I think Scott, I think you, you pretty much covered that pretty well. Just um, resist the temptation to uh, try and think that a, uh, you know, a, let, let's say a, a half acre backyard, okay? resist the temptation to um, allow the thought process to enter that you can have, you know, one zone by the fire pit be completely and totally independent of another zone and not interfere with one another. Because remember, you've got no boundaries. But short of that, I think Scott nailed it. Yeah, and, I, and I think when you say that, Steve, you mean uh, you're not likely to play one type of music in one area and a separate type of music in another area because you're going to get a lot of that cross, uh, um, cross response to the music. Certainly, you can, yeah. you can adjust different volume levels uh, up and down for, for different uh, listening levels, but uh, the sure. source channels should be the same. Yep. Cool. Were there any other, any other questions, Scott? Uh, one more question just came up uh, asking, what's the biggest package you can create for your customers? Uh, if you're using a single amplifier, the Garden Series 16.2 uh, would be the largest system that you can create. Uh, if you if you do have access to something like a DSP 8130 and you wanted to put multiple garden series kits, uh, theoretically, you could do 16.2 four different times because we have eight channels to do that. So if you're looking for ways to get much larger systems within a garden series uh, type of a package, uh, that would be the ideal way to do so. Uh, Sonance uh, does have some different uh, 70 volt options that are more exclusive to direct dealer accounts. Uh, those allow you to scale a little bit bigger just in the nature of 70 volt. Uh, but for the intensive purposes of the calls and the, the two systems that we're discussing today with Garden Series uh, and Patio, 16.2 uh, on a single set of two, uh, two amp channels uh, or multiply that times four if you have a larger amplifier like an 8130. Uh, question came on, uh, can I join Mariners onto a Garden Series system? Steve, do you want to answer to that one? Well, sure, but you, you also need to be you need to be cognizant of the fact that, that Mariners um, are traditionally an eight ohm speaker. So if you're adding those in parallel, if you will, to either the patio or the garden series, then you're, you're you will be lowering the impedance at the amplifier. So just keep, kind of keep that in mind, you know. So it, it's not a no, but it's not a yes in every case. You know, if you were to <coughs> sorry, if you were to and I, I, um, use like one of the examples that, that Scott used, sixteen satellites and two subwoofers from the garden series, that's going to be showing about a four ohm load back at the amplifier. And again, and I'm also going to assume that we've got one amplifier that we're working with. If I were to add a pair of eight ohm speakers in parallel to that, I will have halve, H-A-L-V-E. I will cut the impedance in half. Now I'm at two ohms. Never should you ever, ever design a system to be at two ohms. It can be stable to two ohms, but four ohms is pretty much a cutoff. Now let's, let's say that you've got um, a, uh, patio series that, that's eight ohm and uh, you want to you know add to that that's where you can start looking at you know adding um, additional patio systems or, or, or whatnot same with garden series um, mariners and rocks and, and typical eight ohm speakers um, you have to take into account impedance I guess is what I'm saying well you also need to note that uh, there is no DSP that will work across multiple different form factors 
the DSP uh, in the amplifiers somewhat specific to garden series or patio series. Correct. And in case anybody's curious, that's what garden series looks like installed in a backyard. Crank it up there, John. Yeah, so our internet audio can enjoy the, the, the cool tunes from John's backyard. <laughs> And, and, you know, while while you're cranking it up, John, one, as a as a user, as a as a uh, an end user of the product, why don't you speak to what you've what you've enjoyed, what you've you know, what you've learned from having the system well, in your backyard? I can tell you, it makes my backyard better. Um, it makes my whole life better. Um, just having nice even coverage, which you know, at the moment I cranked it up a little. Uh, if I want to, I could crank it up enough to annoy my neighbors. But uh, the joy of the system is being able to have the nice, even coverage where you can walk all around the space, not have to blast it, but have nice, even coverage, full frequency response, and, you know, an enjoyable outdoor experience. Yeah, for sure. Well, guys, great presentation, I have to say. Um, great Q&A. Uh, Got to really thank my panel, Scott, and, uh, and of course, John, but Steve, great job there. Um, we recorded today's session, so at 4 o'clock today, I'll be sending out an email, and uh, you'll have all the information on that, including the uh, slide deck that you guys saw here. Um, one more question in there from JPA. Scott, do you see that? I, he just, John just made a comment stating that uh, in, in his oh, yeah. uh, demo facility, he's got a, uh, a system in his entry, basically the walk up to the, uh, the facility, uh, which I, I think is a really great call out. I think we talk a lot about the backyards uh, being the location for these systems. Uh, John has done a, a really unique thing and a great job at incorporating music into the entry of the space. So in the front yard, uh, you're, as soon as you walk up towards their facility, you're already in that mode to talk about outdoor audio, which is a, a really cool trick uh, just to put people in the right state of mind when they uh, come to visit you. Right on. Yeah. We've well, got, in we've my got... experience, having done a lot of demos, um, you got to ask that question when you're in a customer's backyard and they've got this nice motor cord out front. Hey, would you like music in the front yard? So when you're entertaining, it sets the stage as people are arriving. And sometimes they go, no, it's really not something I'm interested in. And once you put it in the backyard, a couple of months later, you get the call. You know, I think I actually do want to add that zone out front. So plant those seeds early and harvest on an ongoing basis. I know for volume tone, John, did you talk a little bit about the demo kits that we have available? Uh, I did not, but uh, I know volume tone has several garden series demo kits that are available for dealers to check out take out in the backyard and I can tell you for sure having done it a couple hundred times when you press play the first thing out of the customer's mouth is oh my god they've just never experienced that kind of sound in their outdoor space that's a very very powerful tool I encourage yeah. you guys to maximize yeah. it 